Well, Anthony, thank you so much for joining us. My gosh, we go way back in the times that we've talked. Tell me a little bit about Cities United and how long you've been with that group and the mission, what they're hoping to do. Yeah, good to see you, Rachel, and thanks for uh, hosting this conversation and inviting me to be a part of it. Uh, I've been at Cities United going on six years. Uh, Cities United started in 2011 uh, under the leadership of Mayor Nutter, uh, who former mayor of Philadelphia, and then also Dr. Bell, uh, president and CEO of Casey Family Programs. Uh, they partnered with Mayor Landrieu uh, from New Orleans, uh, Sean Dove and the Campaign for Black Male Achievement in the National League of Cities and really created, wanted to create a space. Mayor Nutter and Dr. Bell's conversation and how all this started was they were having a conversation uh, about the number of homicides uh, of young Black men uh, that, and boys that Mayor Nutter was experiencing in his city and that they did not have a space and a place where he could go and have conversations with other mayors and community leaders to think about solutions and, uh, and ways to reduce this number. Uh, so they created Cities United uh, at launch again in, in, in 2011, actually uh, October the 6th of 2011. So our anniversary, 10 year anniversary is coming up. And it was really just a space and a, a time where mayors and their teams and other community members can come together and talk about solutions and ideas and, and look at what works. Uh, what a real, the ultimate goal is how do we reduce homicides uh, of young uh, black men and boys 14 to 24 and half by the year 2025. That's the big vision that we have. Uh, the goal is for us is how do we really create safe, healthy and hopeful communities uh, for these young black men and boys. It's one thing to you know stop bullets and stop young men from dying, but are we also creating opportunities for them to thrive? Uh, uh, most of these young men live in communities that have been underinvested in, underserved, uh, and some of us intentionally do policies, redlining and other things that have taken place. Uh, so we're trying to turn those around and say, if we invest in these families and in these communities, we would see a reduction in homicides as well. We're going to get to that in just a second, but I wanted to ask you your thoughts. Um, since Tyree Smith was killed, my gosh, the numbers have, have gone up. That disproportionate amount, as you said, of young black men. So tragic with him standing at his bus stop. When you heard about his death, what were your thoughts? What went through your head knowing that this is your life's work trying to prevent just this? And to hear about a child at a bus stop was just so disheartening for a community. Yeah, so I think, uh, Rachel, anytime I hear and I hear about it, on the regular, not just here in Louisville, but across the country. We're losing way too many young people. And that's been a drumbeat since I've uh, uh, been doing this work and we have collectively not changed, right? So whether it's at a bus stop, whether it's at a, on the corner, whether it's in the alley, uh, and you know, we've lost 20 young people under the age of 20, 18 this year. I uh, saw Tyree, that number. Uh, Tyree is one of those 20 and we should have shifted the way we move things when the first one was shot. Right. Uh, so there's work for us to do and we've got to make all of our grounds and our community sacred for our families and for our kids, right? So we, we've, got to, we've got to have the same level of outcry no matter where our young people are heard at uh, and, and what they're doing because all of these young people are victims of this system that has continued to fail them, right? So uh, one of the things we've got to do is just figure out uh, how we move differently, right? So when you ask me about Tyree, it's the same response I have for any of our young people who we lose to gun violence, uh, we are still not doing enough. We still got work to do and, and we need to move with a little bit more urgency and a little bit more intentionality about how we do our work. And I agree with you because there was outrage of that one more so, I think because it was the bus stop, but I completely agree with you. There should be outrage every time we see anyone you know, shot and killed, but certainly children. And with that number, I just read that as well, 20 children. So what are we doing wrong? Is it the system that we have in place? I know that's a very big question. So we're gonna break it down little by little for sure. One thing is that you're talking about reimagining, moving away from the systems that punish and control and reimagining, I don't know if we wanna start with policing, investment in the community, you pick what we wanna start with on how can we reimagine this? Cause what we're doing isn't working. I mean, right. would you agree with that? I mean, we're fundamentally, things are not working to reduce this violence and we're seeing it all across the country. Absolutely. And, and we have to fundamentally shift the way we think about public safety, right? We have been conditioned 
and talk that public safety is police, jails, law enforcement, where those are the things that are reactionary. And what really keeps us safe is making sure that folks can be in affordable and safe housing. Uh, folks can uh, have transportation uh, that gets them to and from, that folks have access to quality healthcare, that folks can actually go to the store and buy food to eat, uh, uh, oh. that folks can uh, find quality jobs with benefits. So those are the things that really keep us safe. And we've invested in the other thing and not truly invested in the things that truly keep us safe, right? So, you know, we've had conversations, Rachel, in this community forever about vacant and abandoned properties around the lack of transportation and, 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 and how folks can maneuver through the city, the lack of jobs in the communities where most of these shootings are happening, right? So we've, and the lack of educational outcomes that happen in those communities too, right? So we've known all of this for decades. Uh, we just as have, long as I can remember, yes, we've long, talked about right. it. So we've been having this conversation. It would come on the news when you were doing the news. We would do a new report. We would say all of these things, but have we truly invested in uh, and and the folk and been intentional in, in our investment? Not just invested in education, but invested in the education of those most at risk. Right. So, so when we remove two, those barriers, Anthony, take me through that. So when we talk about jobs and investment and better places to eat, obviously, because there's a food desert. So when we address all of those, the, the outcomes become better. Correct. Absolutely. I mean, take yeah, you address the that. root causes. Right. I mean, when you start addressing people's root causes and give people full opportunity to participate and to be a part of, you see different outcomes. Right. So, uh, and, and, you know, I'm I'm want to see us get to a place where we have zero homicides and zero shootings. Uh, but again, we have never addressed those root causes. When you start addressing root causes, taking care of people's basic needs and allowing folks opportunities to take care of themselves and their families, you have different outcomes, right? Uh, you have different you have different hopes and visions for your life than you do when you can't have all of that stuff, right? So it's just harder to even breathe when you cannot take care of your basic needs. Right. So we and we've got to, again, one of the things you talked about when we reimagine when folks are when people are making mistakes or getting in trouble, we have been so hard on punishing and, and not just punishing for the moment. But when we put you in jail and we give you a record, that's a life sentence most of the time. Right. That you can never get from under. And then we add on to it. Right. Then you can't vote. You can't drive, so you cannot participate fully in this in 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 in, in, in this uh, society, and it becomes hard. So I think you know again addressing the root causes, and when folks step out of line or get or make mistakes, it's not about punitive; it's about restorative. How do we make sure we can restore folks, bring them back into the community, help them see the you know that what they did was wrong, but it's not a lifelong like lifelong punishment, a lifelong sentence that we have been so used to doing. Uh, uh, and then when we look at our resources, we got to invest those in things that we know will make a difference. Jails have not really made a difference in crime. They just become more crowded. They become more crowded, right? When you were seeing that now. Uh, we got folks sleeping on the floor in prisons and jails, right? We, we, and then again, we just dehumanize people consistently uh, and expect different outcomes. So to view it through the lens almost of a public health crisis, I know that Absolutely. has come up over and over and over again, because that's what we're in the middle of, of as well. And I've even seen people saying, you know, as much as we do um, these COVID news conferences, shouldn't mm -hmm. we be doing something like this? What is our pronged approach for this to see those different outcomes? I mean, do you see that as something that would be helpful? Because it seems like, you know, we only talk about it when there is a you know, a horrible homicide that gets everyone's attention. Maybe this is something that needs to be on our radar at all times and not just one segment in our community, but everybody's. Yeah, I think part of it, yes, I agree that we got to bring better awareness and we got to have a different kind of campaign and we got to have a different level of urgency about it. And I think what happened with uh, the mayor, the governor and folks doing those COVID press conferences, they kept it in front of, they kept it in front of people's faces. It made folks understand that these are the things that we're doing. This is what matters to us. And it made it uh, make sure it made all of us feel like, OK, we're working on this. Right. When we don't hear that there's an actual work happening around homicide reduction and shooting reductions, uh, folks don't believe anything's happening. Right. So I think it would be nice to I don't know if it needs to be a daily update or right. a weekly update, but, just uh, but it needs to have consistency around 
And this is how you as a citizen can participate, right? Because one of the things with COVID is we all knew what we could do to keep ourselves safe, right? And we had options. Exactly. And it's accountability. Absolutely. It's it's accountability to the programs that we have out there as well. I wanted to touch on a couple of things. Since we're seeing this with young people, you know, we've got such a proliferation of guns that it's not hard for anybody to get a hold of them. I, I, I'm assuming we still have a gang problem. I mean, I've been covering that as long as I remember as well. So what do we do with boots on the ground to help take care of those things, Anthony? I, I know there, you know, we've talked about different programs that are in place. What do you see as the effective to meet kids where they are to try to change these outcomes? Yeah, so I think, again, it goes back, there's a number of things. One, you know, where and how uh, is the school system showing up for these young people, right? We we know who's at risk, we know who's in trouble, uh, and how is the school system shifting their resources to have more uh, school counselors, more school resources, folks who can be a part of it. Uh, But then also, what is community doing? You have organizations like No More Red Dots with Dr. Woods, you have Pivot to Peace, uh, you have a number of organizations and places, uh, Urban League and people who have actual folks in the, in the community. Uh, but the, the, the big thing is that the interruption work that Dr. Woods and his team does is the key. They understand who's at odds with each other, who's at beef mm-hmm. with each other, and know how to do uh, conflict resolution and mediation in that so that we can really get uh, uh, folks to put down the guns and, and, and give folks some space to breathe so that they can figure out what the conflict's about and how to resolve it without using the gun, right? We need way more of that in Louisville uh, and we just don't have the right capacity right now, right? Dr. Woods and his team are a small team uh, and, and they need more. They need We need more trained interventionists in this community who can do the intervention work. But we also have Pivot to Peace, which is our hospital-based intervention strategy, right? So when somebody hits the hospital with a shooting wound, you've got folks who can really work in partnership with that young person or that person and their families to help them think about how they don't end back up in the hospital and how they don't and their crew don't go retaliate against whoever shot them, right? So we have opportunities and things in place. It's just how we resource them and how we get them the dollars that they need and the capacity that they need to really do the work. Uh, Then you also just got the folks like in the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods got a whole outreach team who's consistently in community talking to folks, connecting them to resources and making sure that they know what's going on and can be a part of the stuff. So, and again, all of this stuff needs more resources to be built out to capacity because we cannot have another year like we did last year, which we're on pace to actually- uh, Seed. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and we don't shift the way we prioritize what investments look like and what services look like. And then also, I think, you know, uh, I'll go back to nonprofits like the Urban League and other places who are already doing good work, uh, uh, need other folks to send people their way, making sure that these young people and people who are in, our most impacted got wraparound services around them too, right? It's one thing, again, to stop that conflict, but then I got to make sure I can connect you to resources to get you to the outcomes you're looking for. Most of these young people, when you talk to them, are looking for jobs, looking for housing, looking to go to school, and just don't have the right connections and the right resources to do that. And we as a community have all of those resources and can move differently if we choose to. So let me ask you, because it's like until we reimagine that that has been the mantra we've we've heard. How frustrated are you? It's like we're just not are we just not getting it? Is it not resonating with enough people, the right people? Are we not stepping up as a community to say all hands on deck? This is a community wide issue. All of that. (laughs) Frustrated. (laughs) Yes. Check. (laughs) We're not not doing fast enough. That we don't all believe that this is a community-wide initiative, right? We don't believe there's a lot of folks in Louisville who don't think about these shootings on a daily, right? And don't are not concerned with this in a way that they should be, right? Because again, it's happening to predominantly young black men and boys and women in the West End. And a lot of us never even have to go down there, never even have to see. Uh, what this looks like and feels like, right? So I think to this, uh, until this community can understand that these incidents impact all of us and that all of these kids are our kids and all these folks are our people and we should all care. So I think it's part of that. And again, it goes back to that mental model around what public safety is. 
and who deserves to live, who does not deserve to live. They put themselves in harm's way. So they knew what they were doing, but folks, uh, people forget to realize and folks forget to realize that lack of opportunity creates these kind of environments. Lack of disinvestment creates these environments. Lack of isolation creates these environments. And, and, and until we shift that and change that, uh, we're not gonna move differently. So yeah, I think it's the frustration is on all levels of uh, leadership who have not figured out how to come together and work together uh, as a collective to say this is an issue and it's not a political issue. It's an issue that we just need to work through. Uh, we all can have difference of opinions of what it looks like, but we need a system in place and we need to create a system where everybody can participate in, everybody can be a part of uh, and move, right? So frustration with local elected officials, frustrated with the systems that could be different from the school system to uh, any other system, but also uh, saying to philanthropy, you need to be here, right? You need to invest your dollars and then to the business community, you need to invest your resources as well. And not only into the people, but into the places that are most impacted by this. And we have just continued, continually turned our, our blind eye and, and said, it's not happening in my community. It's not happening to my kids. Uh, so I can move forward and, and my life is okay. I've seen a little bit of a glimmer and a little bit of a change in that thought process. And maybe just with more and more talk and starting to see a little bit more investment. I hope that is the trend that continues. I'm seeing the beginnings of it. Would you agree or no? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, with the investment that the uh, uh, Metro made in the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods this year, you know, the office has been around since 2013 when I was, when I helped opened it. And we've never, it's never had a budget that really, that it, that really helped do it, do what it needs to do. And this year it finally got a $4.2 million budget. Uh, which is uh, it's historic for this for the city, but it should have always had that kind of budget. right. And business do believe seem to be getting a little bit more about investment. Uh, that you see some things coming that I'm hoping down the pike will will prove to be true. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, and uh, philanthropy is having conversations. Uh, uh, but I think part of it, though, Rachel, is that we can no longer continue just to have conversations. We just got to oh, move. Action. We had a, right, we had a plan uh, uh, when Dr. Nesbitt and Dr. Hudson put together the plan in 2012 that called for the creation of the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods and a team that works on it. That plan is still relevant to this day, right? If we go back and look at what that plan said, it still has all of the things that you and I just talked about that we have not realized yet, right? And then you go to the office, created a plan, the One Love Louisville plan, it has a lot of strategies in there. Then you look at the path forward, right? There's all of these plans that are sitting and just waiting for investment right. that we don't need to have another conversation about, right? Yeah. We just need folks to move and act uh, and say, I care and here's, here's how I'm gonna show that I care, right? Either I'm gonna come down and spend some time mentoring in one of the spaces where I know I'm needed or I'm going to support and put money into this or whatever it is, this is the time for us to act and not sit back and have more conversation. But I do believe, you know, with the, with, when the, when Breonna Taylor was murdered, we saw this community come out in ways that we never have before. Mm -hmm. When we talk about who showed up at protests, where protests was held and who was leading those protests, uh, changed the course of this city. And hopefully, to your point, that helps people understand that all of this is interconnected, right? You can't have police violence without community violence. They're connected in ways that we need to talk about because they all come from the same, they stem from the same thing, structural racism and systemic racism that has created this environment. So now we have people who are paying attention, people who are listening, and they've got to understand that we have police violence, but we also have community violence that we both all need to be paid attention to. Uh, and we need folks to think about that the same way they did with the, with the murder of Breonna Taylor. You talked about action and totally agree with you on that. Give me two or three things that anybody who might see this, if they're going, you know, I, I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. Give me mm -hmm. three things that people can do. Because I saw that call from Ja'Cory Arthur, and it's like everybody needs to step up and do something. We just can't sit and talk about this anymore. So give me some action items. Yeah, so one, I would call the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods, uh, talk to Monique and her team. She, during that same press conference, listed out a number of opportunities for folks to, uh, to, be in, uh, to get engaged. I think the Cura Journal actually just took that clip and put it out a couple, of, uh, a couple of days ago. So one, 
uh, find out what's happening and, and, and get involved in that. So support the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods, call Monique. They have a ambassador program where they actually walk community members through what it what uh, community violence prevention look like, how to do all of the work that they're talking about, conflict resolution. I think they're even going to start doing stop the bleeding, like when you show up on the scene, how that you can help keep that person alive. Uh, until the to the paramedics get there, so I think that's the number one thing is call Monique and her team, uh, and, and figure out how you can be supportive there. Two, I would say make sure that you look up no more red dots and pivot to peace, and donate resources to those two organizations. They need it bad, uh, and, and they need to make sure that folks support them. And the third thing I would say to folks is call your call the mayor, call your uh, uh, council member. And, and say to them that you want us to use our American rescue dollars to support community violence intervention strategies, that you are, that you want us, you want us to see, you want to see us invest those dollars in, in, in the things that we know that work. And I would also encourage folks to call the school board too, because the school board also has American rescue dollars that can be used to support community violence intervention strategies, right? So I need folks who typically don't call their Metro council members and don't call the mayor's office and don't call the school board to call all your elected officials and say, this is an issue that I care about. This is an issue I wanna see us invest more in. And this is an issue that uh, uh, I wanna hold you accountable to. So those would be my three things. If, if, if folks could do those three things, I think we could see a difference uh, as we continue to build this work out. Thank you, Anthony, for all the work that you do. I mean, it's been your life's work and, and we couldn't do this without you. And thank you for your voice always in our community. Thank you, Rachel. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.